Well, uh, thank you, Ira, and thank you all for coming at this um, a fresh hour of the morning. It's a great honor to be here at this distinguished gathering, and in particular, to appear with two of your most uh, distinguished and important political leaders. Uh, as Eirik uh, alluded to, we are now uh, four decades into what's been called the third wave of global democratization <clears throat> that began with the Portuguese Re Revolution in April of 1974. When that revolution began, <clears throat> only a little less than 30% of all the independent states in the world had free and fair elections to choose their leaders. And democracy really was, as I think you are well aware, a relatively rare phenomenon outside the West. In the subsequent three decades, that is, again, this break point until about 2005 or 6, the number of democracies held steady or expanded. In fact, every year from 1975 until 2007, nothing like this continuous growth in democracy had ever been seen before in the history of the world. Levels of freedom in the world also pretty steadily expanded during these three decades. And then, around 2006, something happened. The expansion of freedom and democracy in the world came to a now prolonged halt. Since 2006, there's been no net expansion in the number of democracies in the world, which constitute about 55% of all the independent states over one million population. And since 2006, the average level of political rights and civil liberties in the world has deteriorated slightly with um, the balance in each of the last nine years being that uh, about twice as many countries in each of these last nine years have declined in freedom as have gained in freedom. One could see the past decade as a period of equilibrium, given that democracy expanded to a number of countries with weak facilitating conditions, such as poverty or an authoritarian neighborhood. Uh, you could say it's impressive that democracy survived or revived in so many places. But I want to articulate several other reasons for concern. First, there has been a rising tide of democratic breakdowns. In fact, the rate of democratic failure in the past decade, 14%, uh, has been twice that of the decade 20 years before, 1984 to 1993. Democracy has been expiring, moreover, in some strategically important states, Russia and Venezuela, early in this century, uh, I would argue Turkey, Bangladesh, and Thailand uh, very recently. Only Thailand's breakdown among these five came via military coup. These days, democracies are more likely to be strangled by their own elected leaders. In recent years, Turkey's Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his ruling party, the AKP, have been borrowing from Vladimir Putin's playbook abusing state authority to undermine countervailing centers of power, punishing dissent, politicizing the judiciary, intimidating the media, and creating a quite clearly hegemonic party system. Uh, it's been so incremental that a lot of people haven't noticed that a threshold has been crossed, but I am now convinced that it has been. And so are most of the Turkish political scientists I know who are willing to render an opinion, at least in private. By now, Turkey has ceased to be even an electoral democracy. It has joined the growing ranks of competitive authoritarian regimes. Since 2005, one in six democracies has failed, many of them in this incremental fashion. The trend of erosion in freedom and the rule of law is not always evident to outside observers. We now take for granted many third wave democracies, like South Africa and Ghana, both countries that I've visited uh, in the last few years, where principles of constitutionalism, accountability, and the rule of law have quietly been eroding. In fact, I know this is a controversial statement, but I began as an Africanist, and I'm willing to defend it in Q&A. There is not a single African country where democracy is firmly consolidated and secure today 
the way it is, for example, in such third wave democracies as South Korea and Chile. In the global democracy promotion community, few actors are paying attention to the growing signs of fragility in a number of relatively liberal developing democracies, not to mention the illiberal ones. Why have freedom and democracy been receding? The most important and pervasive answer is bad governance. If we reorganize the Freedom House data into, out of the two scales of political rights and civil liberties, into three scales that also include the rule of law, we find that every region performs worse <laughs> on transparency and the rule of law than it does on political rights and civil liberties. The deterioration in transparency and the rule of law since 2005 has been particularly visible in many countries. And as more and more African states become resource rich with the onset of a second African oil boom, which is now well underway in Ghana, for example, the quality of governance is likely to deteriorate further. Around the world, this is the more basic point, democracies are struggling with the resurgence of what uh, Francis Fukuyama called uh, building on the work of Max Weber, neo-patrimonial tendencies. Leaders who think they can get away with it are eroding democratic checks and balances, overriding term limits, violating opposition rights, and accumulating power and wealth for themselves, their families, their cronies, their clients, and their parties. <clears throat> the space for opposition parties, civil society, and the media is shrinking in a great many countries that are both third wave democracies and kind of quasi-democracies or aspiring democracies. And international support for these civil society movements and organizations, most alarmingly, is drying up. Ethnic, religious, and other identity cleavages polarize many societies that lack well-designed democratic institutions to manage those cleavages, and, and they are manageable with the right institutions. State structures are too often unable to secure order, protect rights, and meet the most basic social needs, in part because they're so uh, uh, penetrated by clientelistic pressures. Democratic institutions such as parties and parliaments are often poorly developed, the bureaucracy lacks policy expertise and professionalism, and even more so the independence and authority to effectively manage the economy. Weak economic performance and, of course, rising inequality exacerbate popular <coughs> disaffection. And then, of course, you know, in the area where it looked like a promising initiative uh, to uh, expand democracy in the world was underway, uh, namely the Arab world, uh, the hopes of the Arab Spring have almost completely and devastatingly <coughs> uh, imploded in every single one of the um, countries that rose up, except, very importantly, Tunisia. The resurgence of authoritarianism in the Arab world has been part, moreover, of a global trend. Beyond its most, uh, behind its most charismatic and domineering leader since Mao Zedong, China is concentrating power, silencing dissent, violating human rights, censoring media, uh, developing the most sophisticated control of the internet in the history of the world, and fostering fear to degrees not seen, frankly, since Mao. At the same time, China is rapidly expanding its military power and alarmingly its territorial claims, if you're following what's happening in the South China Sea. Russia as well. I don't think I need to tell you, as one of the few countries that has a border with it, is slipping deeper and deeper into naked authoritarianism, cult of personality and military adventure, <coughs> driving political opposition and civil society activists further and further into the margins of fear, inefficacy, or exile, or in the case of Boris Nemtsov, assassination. Joined together in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, these and other autocracies are honing and diffusing digital tools of internet censorship, citizen surveillance, and information control. This is part of a broader trend of renewed authoritarian skill and energy in using state-run media, both traditional and digital, to air an eclectic mix of pro-regime narratives, demonized images of dissenters, and illiberal xenophobic di diatribes. 
The resurgence of authoritarianism has been quickened by the diffusion of common tools, such as laws to criminalize international flows of financial and technical assistance from democracies to democratic parties, movements, independent media, election monitors, and civil society organizations in authoritarian regimes. Autocracies are also gleefully imposing broader restrictions on the ability of NGOs to form and operate, while cynically creating their own pseudo-NGOs, a favorite tactic of Mr. Putin in particular, to do their bidding in domestic and international forums. And we have to be honest in recognizing, I as an American will begin in doing so, that the threats to internet freedom, which is now as basic to democracy and human dignity as the air we breathe, do not merely emanate from the authoritarian regimes of the world. Perhaps the most worrisome dimension of the democratic recession has been the decline of democratic efficacy, energy, self-confidence, and resolve in the West, including the United States. We in the US and in large parts of Europe have some hard reform work ahead to reduce polarization, foster better policy making, and in particular for the US, diminish the cor deeply corrupting influence of money in electoral politics and policy lobbying. And we must adapt and refurbish our alliances and aid strategies I really hope we can talk about that here, for what is going to be an extended and difficult struggle, both against the resurgence of authoritarian states and the mutation and spread of Islamist terrorism. So let me conclude with these points. We need a bold strategy for renewing global democratic progress with the following elements. First, I, as a scholar of democracy, deeply believe that we must give priority in political assistance to the defense and consolidation of already existing democratic regimes. The overriding imperative must be to avoid more breakdowns of democracy, whether by executive suffocation, military coup, or state implosion, and to help uh, consolidate promising new uh, transitional democracies that have emerged uh, even recently, like those in Ukraine uh, and Tunisia. Second, we should prioritize investments to fight corruption and bad governance. This means country-level reforms to build a professional uh, civil service, an independent judiciary, and a comprehensive array of institutions of horizontal accountability, such as counter-corruption and audit agencies that can combat bad governance. These institutions cannot exist merely on paper. They need the resources, the training, and the embedded autonomy to do their job seriously. It also requires new international efforts to identify and return stolen assets and to treat, I know this is a heavy lift, to treat predatory corruption as an international crime against humanity. Third, civil society needs more financial resources, in fact, desperately so, and tools and training in information technology to enhance their capacity to monitor government mobilize citizens, and advocate for institutional reforms. Fourth, we need a new strategy for a new contest of ideas and information. China, Russia, Iran, and ISIS have dramatically expanded their digital capacity to disseminate propaganda and propagate half-truths. Democracies must ramp up their own means to broadcast digitally independent news and critical commentary while also widely disseminating works of democratic theory and scholarship in a wide range of languages. In the era of massive open online courses, which are partly being innovated here at the University of Oslo, we should make learning about democracy freely available to any person, young or old, anywhere in the world, who can find a way to get online or get a thumb drive with megabytes of democratic knowledge. Since the mid-1970s, democracy has enjoyed a great and indeed unprecedented run. But democracies have been slow to grasp the gathering threats of recent years. If we do not respond with vigor, imagination, and resources, we will find ourselves living in a much grimmer and more dangerous world. Thank you.
got a problem with me, please, the floor is yours. First of all, I think it's important uh, to remember, as Larry explained to us, that it has been a substantial increase in number of more or less democratic states over the last decades, both with regard to electoral democracies and liberal democracies. And the two figures of these two types of democracies have been following each other over the last decades. Obviously, there are more electoral than liberal democracies, and I will not use time to explain the difference. I think we immediately understand the main points for that. Especially from the years 89 and 90, it was an impressive increase in number of democratic states. To a large extent, this was, of course, due to the fall of communism in Central and Eastern Europe, but in addition, we saw many new democracies in Asia, in Africa, and in Latin America. That was promising. And allow me just to mention that I had the privilege of being Minister of Foreign Affairs in these years, 89 and 90, and it was unbelievable what we experienced. Reports almost every day from our embassies in Eastern and Central Europe about events, how democracy gained ground almost every day. Most of what was achieved in these years has been saved. Most of these former communist countries have developed and stabilized democracies. Why? I think one important factor was that they rather fast were integrated into European democratic organizations. The first years in uh, OSE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and in the Council of Europe, not the European Council, but the Council of Europe. Uh, and we should not underestimate the importance of these two organizations, especially the first years of democratization in Eastern and Central Europe, because they made a meeting place, a framework, where new and old democracies could meet and exchange views and experience. But later, of course, when they were integrated into stronger uh, organizations as the European Union and NATO, democratic organizations, that contributed to stabilize these democracies. I think we all hope for a new wave of democratization in the aftermath of the Arab Spring in 2010 and 2011, but unfortunately <coughs> not. Only, I think, in Tunisia they have saved most of what they achieved. In, in the other countries, more or less, they have fallen back to authoritarian regimes. And as uh, uh, Larry explained to us, after 26, there has been no net expansion in the number of democracies. A small decline in 20, uh, 2006 and thereafter it flattened out. But we can view this in two different ways. Either as a negative trend that democracy stopped gaining ground or positive trend of a durability of the democratic wave. Nevertheless, the challenge is, of course, to stabilize vulnerable democracies and to expand democracy to more countries. Why promote democracy? Because some are putting that basic question. Some may say that democracy is not the most efficient way of ruling a country. For me, it's obvious that we have an obligation to promote democracy for two main reasons. One, Democracy is the only consequence of being committed to human dignity. Because every human being has a right to influence the society. And secondly, historically we know that democracies very seldom start war against each other. That's interesting. 
So democracy is in a way a conflict, conflict prevention peace work. How promote democracy? I, I allow me to draw a little bit upon lessons learned from the experience of the Oslo Center, because democracy assistance is our main uh, program field. Democracy is, of course, not only free and fair elections and democratic institutions. It's first of all a question of political culture, a way of thinking. In many countries, after an election, there is usual to behave as the winners take it all. <clears throat> to exclude political and other minorities from positions and from influence. And this will, of course, uh, increase tensions and conflicts. So we therefore, when we share experiences with them, emphasize that dem <coughs> democracy is to develop inclusive societies and power sharing. And in this regard, we can say in the Norwegian framework as well. Coalition governments is a good exercise. Because in a coalition government, you cannot take into account only one part of your group's interests, <laughs> but several. Coalition building must be learned. So what we are doing in the, uh, from the Oslo Center is to share our experiences, how to run coalition governments, how to build alliances in parliaments, and between different political parties. Another challenge is that in many countries, the political leadership live more or less in isolation from their people, from common people. So it's so important to build up meeting places between political leaders and the civil society to stimulate, stimulate for dialogue instead of confrontation. Another challenge is that there is a tendency uh, that uh, democratically elected leaders do not step down when their term expires. We know from African countries that several of them have initiated changes of the constitution in order to, to continue in, in their office after their time. And even in European countries now, uh, some are sitting too long in office. And maybe they start thinking that they are the only who can rule this country. And they become more and more authoritarian. Maybe that's a part of the problem in countries which was mentioned here, like Russia, Turkey, and we can also add Hungary. I know all the three leaders of these countries, and I must admit that I am surprised how they have developed and how they behave today compared to 10 years ago. Another important challenge in dem democracy assistance is to increase the knowledge and the commitment to universal fundamental human rights and international law. I cannot use more time on that now. Of course, in the world of today, there is also a threat to democracy that we have these extreme political and religious groups willing to use violence. And therefore, it is so important to make frameworks for interreligious dialogue in order to build down images of enemies and stereotypes. Let me end up by mentioning one, another important challenge, if you should promote further democratization. <coughs> and that is, as also Larry uh, touched upon, the desertions of authoritarianism <coughs> in a country like Russia, a great power, and still it is the case in China. And in my view, it is really a threat to democracy if these power states increase their influence, as we see China especially is doing now in Africa. What will that mean for uh, democracy in the future on the African continent? And what will their Russian behavior mean for the future of democracy, especially in the eastern part of Europe? I just raise the question. So to conclude this short introduction, over the last decades, democracy has gained ground. Don't forget that. But two, over the last 10 years, 
There has been no net expansion of democracy. There have been some steps forward also in the last years, but some breakdowns. For the future, I do believe, I'm almost always an optimist, I do believe that democracy will gain more ground. Because more people will experience that democracy in the longer perspective is to their benefit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dominic. Jonas Kostel, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you to Civita for again raising important issues. And Professor Diamond, thank you for sharing your research. And I'd like to salute all those who do research on democracy and try to provide also uh, facts and figures on, on an issue which also has to be a strongly emotional one. I think I'll, I'll use my, my 10 minutes to um, reflect on what I see as a few dilemmas. And in my view, one quality of democracy is the ability to live with dilemmas and to live with issues that are not black and white. Uh, to live in a society where you have inclusive dialogue so you can reach this very important notion of balanced societies, namely compromise. And I think Kjell Magne Bonovic is, is using this point many times when we, when we meet and discuss democracy, the very appalling principle of the winner takes it all in some notions of democracy which is a very dangerous thing, and especially because those winners who take it all, they take things away from the other side and create seeds for conflicts, which then again may be eroding uh, democracy. It is a simple principle, but a very complex practice. I think that is what we experienced since 1976 with the progress and then the decline, if that intervened in 2006, maybe. Uh, I think that is the lesson we learned how complex the practice is, how important it is that it is rooted very deeply in culture and social mechanisms of that society, be it at the local level, be it at the national level, and I think in Europe we should also question, is it at the continental level? So to me, in addition to talking about government by the people, of the people, for the people, and elections, which we all agree is a key criterion, we should focus on some of these qualities of a complex practice. Kjellwang, you mentioned 1890, and I served that government that you uh, were with you were foreign minister at the time. And I remember a visit to East Berlin and Prague in January 1990. In Prague, Václav Havel was sitting in the chateau. He just had moved in and he was in his jeans and pullover with holes <laughs> on his shoulders, and he was saying, I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna make a system out of this mess. So there were democratic traditions in that Czechoslovakia that he could grab onto when he installed democracy after all those long years of communist rules. In East Berlin, the communists were on their way out. And I remember the state secretary and the foreign ministry said that this is going to an end. The empire is done. And God sei Dank haben wir kein mehr Guillotine. <laughs> so he was happy that his head will still be on top uh, of his body <laughs> after that change. So there were seeds for this. I think one important thing in democratic research which we have to worry about and care about and interest uh, our focus is about the quality of the civil society. It's uh, pluralism. It's mechanism, because democracy for individuals is more than putting the ballot. It's also about having a daily experience of being able to influence what is around you. At the workplace, in your local community, who is going to build a road across your property, and all these <coughs> dimensions which gives the culture of being co-responsible, which I think is absolutely key. And that's why democracy, which is being imposed by a coup, and democracy which is being installed from outside without having these cultural sensitivities, understanding them is almost doomed to fail. And remember about our democracy, which we are proud about for good reason, if we really study it, as we did, Mr. President of Parliament, last year, 200 years after the Constitution, all those <coughs> decades of civil society and popular movement that led to the formation of our political parties. 
very important to understand the functioning of our democracy today. Now, the second part is a bit follow-up of what uh, uh, Kjell Magne said. This should be an idea which time has come. In the sense that we live in a global market economy, where we know that people's ability to thrive, have influence, use their knowledge, uh, creativity, is the key criterion for success in taking advantage of new technology, develop new technology, organize around new technology, all that leads people to say, I want influence. I want to be heard, I want to be seen, which are key criteria for uh, democracy. Now, China might, may be the example to say that that is not happening. But I remain an optimist. I think eventually it's going, it's going to push in that direction because people will eventually mm -hmm. ask their say. And it really struck me when I visited China as a foreign minister until China did not want visits from foreign ministers for this very dangerous, big, small country, Norway. It struck me when I met lawyers. They told me that until, 19, until 1980, there were no private lawyers in China because there was a political legal system. All conflicts were solved by political decisions. But after the market economy was let loose, they needed a legal system and they needed lawyers to do that arbitrage of conflict of interest. And eventually that should lead to people, all these operators, having influence over their decisions, having the creative process which should lead to democracy. Let's hope that is um, may, may be happening. Third observation. I think authoritarian rule is extremely attractive, seen from a democratic standpoint. Because you see everything they can do without any hindrances. <laughs> they can just decide. They don't need to spend time in parliament, they didn't, don't need to consult people, they can just move on. And when you dig deeper, you find out that is not the case. They are very vulnerable. And because they have no antennas in this civil society, they have fear pictures which don't always resonate with truth. And we see that the most authoritarian quest, uh, countries are also sometimes the most inefficient in decision making. It struck me when dealing with the Middle East, Saudi Arabia is a very authoritarian country, but with a very complex decision making. They have 2,000 princes to consult. We have only a few parliamentarians across the street. I think it's much easier. So, there are some reasons for concern for them, <coughs> for me. And one key is, of course, legitimacy. And I believe, in, and I would in, be interested to hear Professor Diamond, is modern democracy dependent on progress and advancement? Can democracy cope over time with decline? Because legitimacy is, of course, key to democracy. The legitimacy of leaders, we who are elected, we have to be held to account. Do we deliver? We promise things, we have ambitions, we set out to deal with challenges in society. Can we deliver? And the problem nowadays is that people say, we are in doubt. Because employment is chronically high, you don't settle the environmental, climate issues. Uh, cities are growing, urbanization is taking place at a pace which is not creating better life in cities, and so on. And we see the fragmentation of the political system, where the state-bearing parties are losing ground, and you have populist grounds growing from both sides. So this is a question, I think, a true dilemma. Modern democracy is vulnerable when there is no progress, growth, jobs, solving of key issues. And in Europe, I believe we have a double challenge. On the one hand, chronic unemployment, youth unemployment, and social tensions which are not being dealt with on the one hand, and the EU which really merited its, its, its um, peace price for securing democracy at that critical stage, is in itself struggling with its legitimacy. Ten years ago, countries in Europe were looking for the EU as where they wanted to go. This is no longer the case in many of the new member states. They do not necessarily want to go in the, in, in the same road, which gives, again, breathing ground for authoritarian rules. The US, beacon of democracy, has institutions which no longer function. Let's, let's be blunt about it. I mean, that system, Professor Diamond, mean, you can elude us, but I mean, the system was based on the fact that the liberal part of the Republican Party and the right part of the Democratic Party overlapped and could settle issues when it came to real reforms. And now they operate more like a parliamentarian European system where they are separated. And they're not able to solve and deal with real issues. Final remark. The cultural seeds of democracy. 
the attraction is that I walk the system because I have a say. So I have an influence. This is being challenged, I think, by a phenomenon we need really to understand, which is the role of identity in the 21st century. Is this the issue which is most attractive? Now we have, surprise, religion becoming a key identity issue, breeding military movement, strife and conflict. It should be the other way around. Most religions have another, another um, objective. And we have culture. And we have all dividing lines which are not leading to the breeding ground of democracy. And the final, final remark is, of course, on the opportunity, if there is one, to assist in building democracy from the outside. How successful is it? <coughs> now, in the last decade, it has been done by military might. Didn't go well. I must say, personally, as a foreign minister, I have been pushing in countries for them to hold elections because it's a sign of democracy. And we need to ask, is pushing for election really helping democracy? In some instances, pushing for elections at the wrong moment create divisions and tension and conflict. I mean, we pushed very hard for elections in Afghanistan, and once they had a result, we said, well, you know, that result, we, we have to negotiate <laughs> to find the right way to deal with it. And then I would just like to say that I think there's one element that Professor Diamond mentioned. I, I think it is important for the breeding ground or the, the cultural seeds of democracy, which is the danger of polarization, which is limiting our ability to find the compromises day to day in democracy, solving the small issues. And there we are on to issues of uh, inequity, uh, of, of people who can look each other in the eye, comparing you know, life conditions, not having these huge differences, which creates different classes of belonging. So I remain an optimist, but I think there are key, key challenges uh, to democracy which uh, keep some very unpleasant questions all too open. Thank you.